That's actually it for um, announcements here today. I want to open up this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, so turn on your Bibles. I'll never get sick of saying that. Turn on your Bibles and scroll to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to do the very end today. But I want to introduce it this morning by taking you all the way back to 1988, so you guys weren't born yet. Uh, but you've probably heard this song. You guys remember Bobby Farron's biggest hit, yeah. Don't Worry, yeah. Be Happy? Remember it? Everybody, do, 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 right? Remember that? Well, I was studying this week, and we're going to be talking a little bit about worry this week. So I was like, you know, what could I use? And I started thinking about that song. Should I use that song? And out of curiosity, I, I went and I read the lyrics because all through, I mean, he must say, what, a thousand times? Well, I'm exaggerating. He says a bunch of times, don't worry, be happy, don't worry, be happy. And so I want to go read the lyrics to see if he ever explains to us why. Why? That's a good question. Why should we not worry and be happy? And he says things like, you know, uh, uh, too bad your rent is late. Now the landlord's going to litigate. Don't worry, be happy. I'm like, well, that doesn't really work, does it? Yeah, like, oh, I feel much better now. My landlord's going to litigate, right? The only encouraging line I could find at all in the song was, um, your, your, you will, your frown will bring others down, so don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> and that doesn't work either, but why? Why should we not worry be happy? Well, you know what? He never says. What, what, what reason do we have not to worry? Because he says we have no money, we're getting kicked out of the house, there's no food to eat which I thought was perfect for today's scripture where we're going to be going, but just don't worry, be happy. But there's no why. So I'm going to submit to you this morning that this morning our Savior Jesus says, don't worry. Now, he doesn't say be happy, and I'm glad he doesn't because that's a whole different topic, but he does say don't worry, but he is going to give us a valid reason to back up what he tells us. So in Matthew chapter 6, let me just back up, very brief review. The Messiah King has arrived. He's claimed it. He's pretty much proved it already through prophetic um, prophecies. Prophetic prophecies. That's a little redundant, isn't it? Through prophecies that he has fulfilled already. And he has now gathered kingdom subjects, the outcasts mostly, and brought them up onto a mountain, kind of a Moses-type moment, he, only he brings them up the mountain. And he has been giving now for weeks, chapters as it is, um, at least in our reality here, Teachings about kingdom living, what living in God's kingdom is going to look like. If I could summarize it, it's all about how we are to love one another, how to give, how to do good works, how to pray. He also, by the way, teaches how not to give, how not to do good works, and how not to pray, right? And, but I want to back all the way up because before we even got to the Sermon on the Mount, Tony, our youth pastor, did a great job saying that everything you're going to hear about this Sermon on the Mount, about kingdom living, in the end, it really all boils down to where is your heart, your life's motivation and your heart. Where is it at is most important. And today, no surprise, is based upon the attitude of your heart. So if, you, uh, if you've got your Bibles open now, in the NIV, uh, we're going to start at verse 19. And the NIV above it um, has written in, Jesus teaches about money. You know, and already I can see everybody in this room except Joe McAvoy go, oh, he's going to teach about money. Wouldn't you know, darn it, we should, of all the churches we could have picked this morning, oh, yeah. And Joe's like, it's about time. Yeah, right. Let's talk about money. Sorry, Joe. But on behalf of everybody else, it's actually really not about money. I mean, there, there's money involved in it. It's more about your heart attitude. And I'm going to show you why. And I hope I can prove this because not everybody I've seen preach on this topic is going the way I am, but I feel pretty strongly about this. So bear with me on this, but let's get started. Verse uh, 19, let's read to 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, I know you Sort of, um, well, I'll read the last one too. For there your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I underline these words for obvious reasons because I want to point something out to you because they are very related. In other words, it says don't store, which we know, your treasures. But in the, in the Greek, the words for store and treasures are almost absolutely synonymous. Um, the for, um, to not store is thesorizo, and treasure is thesauro. You get it? You know what a thesaurus is? Anybody? You guys are too young. But remember a thesaurus book? 
where, you know, to give you, it's, it literally means a treasury of words. That's what a thesaurus is. It's a treasury of words. But what's interesting, look what he's actually saying here. Don't thesaurusize on your thesauruses, right? Don't treasure your treasures on earth. But instead, he says, treasure up your treasures in heaven. Does that make sense? In other words, value your values in heaven. Value what is valuable in heaven. That's what you are to treasure. So I want to just sort of back up here a little bit because a lot of preachers that I've seen on this, they start immediately talking about wealth and the problem of wealth, and then they try to get defensive because if you're aware, the Bible does not teach that it is a sin to be wealthy. In fact, it greatly encourages you to work hard, save your money, you be smartly, and be successful, just so you know. So we don't need to sort of um, defend that, and I also always find that idea funny um, in this room because we're 21st century Americans. We are you know, pretty much categorically some of the wealthiest people that have ever walked the planet. No matter who you are in this room right now, just by the fact that you're a 21st century American. But we, we never compare backwards, do we? We always compare up. Because right now you're thinking, yeah, about those rich people, right? You don't, you're not like, you know, when people right now in the slums of Manila, guess who they think are rich? Everybody in this room right now, right? Isn't that funny how we kind of do that? But we don't have to even go there because I really don't think this is what's, go what's going on. What's happening here is we're being told, what do you treasure? What is big and what is important to you? And you shouldn't make that what is here, the things of this earth, because our God treasures us. He desires us. He desires our hearts. Remember, it's all about our hearts. Where your treasure is there, your heart will be. Oh, in fact, I had a great quote. I, I think I skipped it. Yeah. He's not saying if we put our treasure in the right place, then our heart will be in the right place but that the location of the treasure indicates where our heart already is. So how we live out our lives indicates what we treasure in our heart. Now bear with me, because we're gonna be coming back to all these things, because right now it looks almost like Jesus takes a little weird detour, like a digression, like what is this? I don't get, where does this go? Let me, let me show what I mean. You're, you're all familiar with this verse, but it, it's almost like what is this doing here? So uh, go to verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy or clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy or dark, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, doesn't that feel like, what does that have to do with treasure? I thought we were talking about money, right? Well, I, the reason I put clear and dark next to the words healthy and unhealthy is because healthy and unhealthy is how the new NIV translates it. Mine, um, mine was like good, and the old NIV is if your eyes are good, but if your eyes are bad. I'm glad they got rid of those because good and bad has really weird connotations. But clear and dark is really good. And here's why. The eye here is referring to the heart that we've just been talking about above. If your heart is clear, if you treasure the things of God, then the light comes in and gives you spiritual understanding. You're flooded with spiritual light. And consequently, if you are blinded by putting your treasure in the things of the world, if you're blinded by material possession and your eyes are cast down into only earthly and worldly things, well, it is spiritual blindness. So remember these two ideas because when we get to part two of the message today, you're going to see why that is such a big problem. In fact, I said in my notes, it will be made clear, and I realized that was an accidental pun, wasn't it? Yeah. But I will make it clear a little bit, I promise. And then lastly, this last verse from part one, I know you know this already. Chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 24, for no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And everybody knows this one, right? You cannot serve both God and what do we normally say? Mammon. Everybody knows mammon from the King James. Isn't that funny how we all know mammon for some reason? I don't know why, right? Now, this is a really basic teaching. I I'm not even going to spend too much time here. But it's just, it's basic, but it's kind of complicated living out. But, but what I want to submit to you this morning is like, it doesn't mean you're always one or you're always the other. Because I know in my life, I sort of vacillate between these two ideas. But what I know is that the two ideas can't coexist. Does that make sense? Let me, let me explain. You know, like I um, have in my life on, okay, I was going to say occasions, let's be honest, numerous occasions, <laughs> laid in bed awake at night worried about money. 
I have. And if it's not money, it's like something that involves money, like my, my van, my car. I, I don't know how many nights I lost sleep over my van. Will it work tomorrow, you know? Um, yeah. Will it leak? And the answer was always yes, yeah? But you see, when I'm thinking about my van and my money, what am I not thinking about? God in heaven. You see how they're sort of mutually exclusive that way? And it doesn't mean like you are a always a worldly-minded person, and someday you reach this point of, I no longer think about physical things. I am only existing, and my treasure is only in heaven. Well, maybe you are. I'm not. Good for you. No, just kidding. <laughs> but I vacillate. I catch myself stressed out to no end about the physical things, money, where am I going to live, how are we going to make the mortgage payment, da 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 Which, by the way, I, I think it's okay based on what's coming up, Okay. So, but the verse is true. Um, when you opt to keep your eyes on these earthly things, you are not thinking about God. Now, let me just pause here because a lot of guys stop right here. This is the end of the message, right? And then they go into this big thing about money, the root of all evil, or the love of money, the root of all evil, and they talk about why you should give more, and that's where Joe thought I was going to go today. But I want to submit to you, I really don't think this is where the concept Ends. This is not time to start a new chapter or even a new message. There's going to be a paradigm shift, yes, but everything in part two of today's message reflects back to part one about where you put the treasures, where your heart is. And one reason I know I'm pretty confident that this is all one package is the first word of verse 25. Put it up, will you? Therefore, I tell you. <laughs> okay. Right? It wouldn't say therefore if it wasn't relating. In fact, the other translation of therefore is for this reason. Are you with me? For what reason? Well, for the reason about careful where you put your heart, where you, what you treasure, right? For this reason. So what he's going to tell us now is pay attention to where, what you treasure and where you put your treasure, so to speak. And don't treasure your earthly treasure because it brings this. I'm going to read a whole big chunk of scripture, 25 to 31. Let's go for it. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or drink or about your body. What you will wear is not life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are, they not much more val are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grasses of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not Worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? What does the theme seem to be? Worry. This is the theme. Worry. It's not about how much money you have or what you spend your money on. It's where are you putting the trust of your heart, okay? Now, um, by, by the way, i got to sort of just pause right here. <laughs> you know this, all this bit about, um, look at the birds of the air. They don't soar, they don't reap, or they don't store away in barns. Yeah, yeah, da, da, da. And then he's like, and consider the lilies of the field. And I know you know all this, right? I was listening to uh, Tim Mackey and John Collins talk about this the other day, and their comments were just classic, so I had to write them down. They're like, is this the hippie Jesus? <laughs> and then I love this. He sounds kind of irresponsible, <laughs> right? <laughs> look at the flowers, man. Be like a bird, right? And... I think those guys are onto something. But I want to say this. You could laugh about sort of Jesus being the hippie Jesus for that part, but let me ask you this. And be honest with yourself and be honest with your sinful nature right now. Do you not hear this a little bit the way my sinful nature does? Which is, yeah, Jesus going, don't worry, man, I'm going to feed the birds. Da, da, da. And you're like, yeah, easy for you to say, Jesus. Because I just don't have that ability to take one dollar and, <laughs> and have my mortgage payment, right? Actually, Jesus, I got to go to work tomorrow. You know why? Because if I don't go to work, I'm not going to get paid. And if I don't get paid, I'm not going to eat. And I'm not going to have a place to live. Do you feel a little bit like that? No, come on. I can't be the only one here. It sounds just a little too good to be true. Like, oh, I get it. Oh, don't worry. Like, I'm just going to not even show up at work tomorrow. Why? Because Jesus said, right? Like, go try it. 
<laughs> That'd be great, yeah? And, you know, one or two of you could pull it off, but what if everybody in this room is like, yeah, I'm not going to worry. I'm just going to, you know, trust Jesus to, like, I don't know, feed me the way he does the birds. I'll wake up in the morning, and there'll be, like, bird seed on my bed. I don't know, like, right? Are you with me? I just want to be honest with you on this point, okay? Because it could appear this way. That's why I want you to consider that word worry. This is where we're going with this. Jesus isn't saying, quit your job. Don't bother. Just, I'll just deliver food to your door and your landlord's going to be like, don't worry about it. I got a word from the Lord, right? No, it's not at all where he's going with this. It's the worry, worry, worry. It occurs. I think I, for, I, I lost count. I should have counted. I think it's like five or six times Almost one per verse. Worry, worry, worry. Don't worry, worry. Now, so let's, let's, let's focus on that. The word worry, okay, um, it comes from an old, uh, old German word that means to strangle or choke. And you know what? That is exactly what worry does, doesn't it? Yeah? It's a kind of mental and emotional, and I'm just going to add this, spiritual, a strangulation, a cutting off of life. And, and Jesus himself even says in verse 27, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And you know, the flip side is true. I, you know, I could have dragged out these statistics or whatever. Worrying shortens your life. It quite literally worrying cuts your life short. It is a literal strangulation of your life. And by the way, it doesn't take much to worry about to really jump into it, does it? In fact, I, I stole this uh, um, next illustration from John Corson, um, who, who wrote something about it. I'm going to share with you in a second. But I'll start by telling you a story. I was in Sydney, Australia um, one, one morning. I had flown in the night before. And the next morning, we were scheduled to fly up to the Gold Coast to see the, um, the Billabong uh, Pro con Surf Contest, which has been a lifelong dream of mine, a really, really big deal. And I like to get up early when I'm on vacation, so I got up at like real early, went out, and I went to go find coffee. And it's this beautiful, foggy morning, right? Super foggy. And I'll never forget, I was walking down the street in Sydney just going, oh, it's so gorgeous, it's cool, and you know, it's foggy. And then I, I walk back to my hotel, which is right across the street from the airport. And I'm like, and it's such a quiet morning. Quiet. Uh-oh. How come I don't hear any airplanes? And I run upstairs to the hotel room, and I turn on the news. And they're like, all of Sydney's airports shut down, fogged in. And I'm like, oh, no. Like, there's going to be a heat later this morning. I was hoping to catch, you know, see Kelly Slater's heat in about four hours from now. And then it turned into full panic mode, my wife and I, because we, you know, we're supposed to check out at 10, and we don't have another place to stay, and we start freaking out. And then I read yesterday what John Carson said, really interesting thing about fog. Did you know that if you take the amount of fog it takes to cover seven square city blocks at a depth of 100 feet, are you with me? Seven city blocks at a depth of 100 feet, and you took all that condensation and collected it all together, it equals about half a cup. <laughs> so in other words, my being able to see Kelly Slater surf was being threatened by half a cup. And I literally was telling my wife, you'd think in the 21st century they'd have radar or something, you know? How is it possible that we can't fly because of fog in the 20... Half a cup of water. Now, you see where I'm going with this on worry? Worry just a little bit. Doesn't take much, does it? Oh, I wonder if my car will start tomorrow morning. Oh, and if my car doesn't start, I might be, oh, I'm late to work. And if I'm late to work, and da-da-da. And, and pretty soon, this is what John Corson said. When you lay in bed awake at night worrying, how will this work out? How will I do this? Before long, you can't see straight, and your airport is shut down. And you're not hearing from the Lord because you're all fogged in. Now, remember that word clear and dark? from the earlier illustration about the eye, you're beginning to see the connection between where you put your trust, where you put your heart, who you're hearing from, what you're looking for, and what happens when you begin to fog your vision through perhaps trust in material things, and then you begin to worry, and the whole thing clouds you over. That's why I love this next verse, verse 32. For the pagans run after all these what? Things, yeah? Things. And I love this. This is like one of those just little half of verse that is so incredibly encouraging to me. Isn't it great that in this whole thing, Jesus put after the whole little lilies of the field and the birds, you know, and the birds of the air, 
your heavenly father knows that you need these things. What is he talking about? What do you need? Food and shelter. You need these things. This isn't Jesus going, oh, those things, they're not even important. No, no. It is important that we have a place to live. It is important that we have food to eat. The, the Bible teaches all through Scripture we are to work, we are to earn, we are to gather, we are to create and have food and have places to live. But what he's saying here is don't be like the pagans because they treasure the stuff. They treasure the worldly treasure, and they've put all their hope into this material world. But God knows your needs. And so here's the punchline. He's going to tell us then what we ought to do, and it's in verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Now, you hear this all the time, don't you? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all that will be given to you as well. And I went and read a whole bunch of different guys' take on what, what does that mean? What does it actually mean to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? And it's kind of funny because everybody kind of had their own ideas kind of based on where they were coming from. Like it's a lot of evangelicals. To seek first his kingdom means to spread the gospel. And I'm okay with that. That works. But I think it's more than just that, right? The word seek means to actually like to go after with all your energy. And uh, I know that um, like John Enns and the younger guys, they use this term all the time as a, what do you guys say, a follower of Jesus or someone who chases after? What do you always say? Disciple. Disciple? Now you use a more generic term. Like I'm a Jesus follower. I'm a, I, you know, I chase after. And I, and I love this idea which is basically, we've been talking about Jesus the King. And how would you chase after the kingdom? You chase after the King. What it means, roll it all the way back to the first verse that we started. Where do you put your treasure? Put your treasure with Jesus your King. Seek Him, seek His will for your life. Seek to desire His rewards that He gives you. And one example I could think of I thought was pretty good was King David. Because King David, it says in the scripture what, uh, um, he was, well, let's, well, look what Paul wrote about King David in the book of Acts uh, 13, 22. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God, God, you got to love this. Who testified? <laughs> God testified. God would know because only God knows a man's heart, right? God knows. I have found David a man after my own heart. David's heart was seeking after God, yeah? And, and by the way, as your pastor this morning, you know, I could lay out all kinds of things. You know, read your Bible, pray every day, serve God, be here, be part of the community, and chase after Jesus. And he says, if you do that, God will take care of everything else. As you follow along, he will make sure you have enough to eat and a place to live. He, he knows your needs, he knows your needs, and he has your needs dialed already. But what he desires is your heart and your trust, and for you to enter into a loving and living relationship with him. And then lastly, we'll wrap up with this last verse, because it's yet another therefore. Okay, in the light of all that, yet another therefore. Verse 34, therefore, do not what? Worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry enough for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And my only thing to add to this before I wrap up this morning is, isn't that classic, don't worry about tomorrow? Because what else would you worry about, right? Do you ever worry about what happened 20 years ago? No. no. Like, I don't worry about the fact that 11 years ago I broke my arm and couldn't surf for six months. Did I mention I broke my arm? You can't believe I brought that up yet again, huh? It will never go away. But I don't worry about the fact that I broke my arm 11 years ago and couldn't surf for six months. I don't lay in bed awake at night going, oh, man, 10 years ago, I couldn't surf for six months. What I worry about is three weeks ago, I smashed my shoulder. I might not be able to surf for two more months. <laughs> Am I worried about six years ago, 10 years ago? No, I'm worried about tomorrow. All worry, isn't that interesting? All worry is based in what might happen we don't even seem to worry about much about what happened. We just are worried about tomorrow. And I love that Jesus says that. Don't worry about 
tomorrow. And I could have gone this whole way in this sermon about how in, you know, in the book of um, Exodus and how God goes before you and it's really cool. He's already in tomorrow. He's already paving the way for you, but I'm not really going to go there today, right? So I want to um, wrap up with three ideas um, this morning, right? First of all, let's go back to this idea of heavenly treasure, and it reminded me of the last time I spoke about three or four weeks ago. And remember, remember the message that day was, don't do your good works before men because then you will get your just reward. And, and, the, and the theory behind that was, what good does it do to impress men to hope to get a reward from them when God says, do your good works for me and I will reward you. And I kind of made a dumb joke and I kind of insulted accidentally Larry Dill because <laughs> I said, I go, would you rather receive your rewards from the sovereign king of heaven who knows your every need, who controls every molecule and can bless you abundantly? Or would you rather get your reward from, and then I just off the top of my head said, Larry from church. And then later on, I'm like, sorry, Larry. But it's true. Like, who would you rather get your reward from? Now look what we're being faced with in these verses today. If you're worried because you're trusting in material things, has that helped? Is that helping you to keep your focus on the things in front of you? And God says, put your treasure in heaven with me. Put your trust in me. Seek me. Seek First, me, and trust me that I will take care of even fixing your van or whatever the heck the thing is. Does that make sense? But your worry is compounded by what you see in front of you. Because here's what God has as a reward. It's really interesting. If this is all we got, even if he didn't get your car fixed or didn't solve your problem for tomorrow or whatever the thing is, what if we got this instead from Galatians 5, 22 through 25? But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. Oh, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. And I love this. We live by the Spirit. Yeah. That's not the material. We don't live by the material. We don't live by the physical, because every physical thing on this planet will break, won't it? Eventually, it all turns to dust. It all lets us down. It all breaks. What did Bob Dylan say? Everything is broken. We live by the Spirit, so let us keep step in the Spirit. And so my second point today is this is difficult for us to do, but this is what we are to seek after. But I wanted to share a little brief thing with you that I learned actually this week. It was totally unrelated to my studies. Because, you know, I'm always teaching you about on Sunday mornings that the, the spiritual has more depth and meaning than the physical. And yet we live in a world that completely dismisses that idea, right? Because if, you know, if somebody has an issue and say, I, you say, I'll pray for you. And they're like, yeah, what is that going to do? I've got an actual problem here. And you praying, right? But we know as believers that there's power in prayer. We know that transcendent ideas like love, justice, and mercy are these incredibly powerful ideas. And yet we live in a physical world. But I found something in the scripture. Actually, I should say somebody revealed something to me in the scripture. I never really saw how important this idea is to God. And it takes us all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I never really noticed it before. But remember, God, he says, if you eat of the fruit of the tree of life, what will happen? You will die. And then Adam and Eve eat from the fruit, and they don't die. Sort of, right? If you didn't know anything, and I trust most of you know where I'm already going with this, you'd be like, hey, uh, God said you ate the fruit, you'll die. But they don't die. But they don't die what? Physically. Do you understand that was a, that was a spiritual death that they died? In fact, this is the most important thing because it is this spiritual death that happens right there when they, when they disobey God. They cause separation between them and God and then separation between each other. Remember the first thing, uh -oh, first thing Adam says <laughs> in his new fallen state? That woman you gave me. <laughs> what did he just do? He just offended the only two people he knew in his entire life. All he had was God and his wife. 
the first thing he says insults both of them. Separation, division, strife, right? And it is from this point that God kicks off his entire plan of salvation, not to save us from physical death, but to save us from spiritual death. You see, the spiritual reality is the important reality in our life. It gives us love and joy and peace because no matter what happens in the physical reality, if you have love, joy, and peace and all those good things, you can get through anything, can't you? We seek God and his kingdom. We put our treasure in him. We seek his treasure, his heart, our heart with him. And then lastly, I'll end with this because I want to submit one way that you can live out what I'm telling you right now. And it comes from a good friend of mine by the name of Rich Hansen who once taught me in script. He said, in, in the ministry, only people matter. People matter. Not stuff, not budgets, not vans. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> not offering <laughs> people, 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 people. And one way we, we exhibit treasuring what God treasures, are you with me? What does God treasure? People. people. Hey, you got it. You got it. You see? So I want to wrap up this morning sharing you a, a little story where God, God taught me this. And that is, um, well, 11 years ago, my wife and I built a, a brand new home. I think we have a picture from the outside there it is, pretty much like right around the day we moved in. And it was like, I mean, have you ever built a home? You know, let me just hold on for a second, Lucas. Let me just hold on. Have you ever like bought a new washer or new dryer or a new refrigerator? And for like a week, you're like, wow, you go into the kitchen, you're like, new fridge, yeah. You know, it's kind of like that, yeah? But you know when you build a new house, everything's new. And you walk around the whole house like, wow, new New sink, <laughs> new laundry machine, <laughs> new bathtub, new counters, everything's new. You're just like, oh. And so here's what I did. The day before we moved in, the house was so pristine that I went around and I took pictures. So I want to show you a picture right now of the inside of my house. Oh, God. I said, oh. 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 Oh, I can't believe that happened. That was real. It looked like that at one time. <laughs> so I took pictures, right? So I want, you to just, I want you to just admire my tiger wood floor. Oh, isn't it beautiful? It was so beautiful. And here's what happened. On Sunday, the net, this is a taken on a Saturday, I had everybody that had a truck help me move right after church. So like we had lined up like six or seven pickup trucks. I had all my stuff ready to go. Everybody, da 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 and we were moved in like 90 minutes. We were completely moved into the new house. It was all just boxes and everything, and I'd ordered all this pizza to bless everybody, but people were like, no, we're good, thank you, and they all left, and so like five boxes of pizza showed up, and I'm sitting there with my very best friend, Matt Drake, and his wife, and their two children, and we're like sitting there like our new house, oh, you know, and while we're doing this, I'm standing right at that kitchen counter, and I hear... <laughs> And I look over, and my eight-year-old son, or six-year-old, I think he was six, buddy, yeah, is sitting in a laundry basket that was in his nice carpeted room. And Matt's lovely son, who was eight, he's kind of big for his age, he's about 6'5", 250, yeah, at eight, <laughs> big kid. He is pushing Cozy in the laundry basket, only they're no longer on the carpet, they're on the new cherry wood floor, and apparently there is either a grain of sand or a piece of gravel. And this is what I see. <laughs> and I quite literally was like, you ever had these moments? No! Do I? If I'd taken that same picture the next day, you would have seen in that picture this gouge all the way across the floor. And I remember, right, Matt, just going, oh, well, <laughs> what do you do, <laughs> right? Like, what it, where, where's your treasure, right? Everything on this earth, everything breaks down, everything lets you down, right? By the way, just for fun, I went looking yesterday. I can't find it. There's so many zillions of scratches. Like, it's just, is that, and here's my point. This is my, still my best friend, Matt, and Maddie be, still is like a son to me, right? Only people count, right? Stuff is just stuff. What matters 
is people, the family, ohana, us being here. And here's the thing. No matter how much money or stuff you might possess right now in this room, you know what every single person is so wealthy in right now? Your ability to love others. Like, think how how abundantly you are blessed right now with the ability to, when the service is over today, go to somebody and say, hey, by the way, I've always wanted to say how much I've enjoyed you. Hey, I've always wanted to say thank you for, uh, you know, Megan, the way you sing just so blesses my soul. Thank you. Or, or to go to somebody and go, hey, how you doing? I, I know, you know, I know, you're, you know your so-and-so passed away a while back, and I just want you to know I'm thinking about you, and I care about you, and I love you, and I pray for you. You realize how wealthy we are? and the things that are really important, I believe this is what it means to seek first his kingdom. If we treasure God, then we treasure what he treasures, and what God treasures is people. Does that make sense, yeah? I'm gonna wrap up with this last verse, and then we're gonna take a very quick communion, but guess who forgot to get his own communion cups? Josh, can you give me, go get me, oh wait, no, Charlie's gonna get it. Josh, you just stay still there. I want to read this last verse out of Matthew. I think it's 13. Is it Matthew 13? Yeah. The kingdom of heaven. Oh, thanks, Ron. Extra. Oh, extra. <laughs> you were going to take two, Ron? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Thirsty. <laughs> this will not. Never mind. <laughs> Look at this. The kingdom of heaven. Oh, it's like a treasure. Oh, isn't that great? It's a treasure hidden in a field, and when a man found it, he hid it again. And then you got to love this. In his joy, he went and sold what? All the stuff, right? Yeah, and he bought, and I love this, oh, chicken skin, a little bit of tears in the eyes right now, yeah. How about that field? Because that's what matters, right? People matter. Now, we're holding our hands physical evidence of a spiritual reality of God treasuring you that we might treasure him. Because all those years ago in the garden, our disobedience, we separated, separated ourselves from God and from each other, and it's been this, this spiritual destiny of death and destruction, and God instituted an incredible plan to rescue us from ourselves, from our sin, from our separation, and to bring us back into him. And 2,000 years ago, the very guy who just taught us these verses that we've read today, who told us what's important to him, knowing full well what awaited him, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body to be broken for you, for us to be with him. Let's remember. Open it slowly. Oh, think, think of what this represents. Isn't it awesome? God gives us just this little physical thing. It's, I mean, what is it? We don't know what it is. It's purple. God knows. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> God knows, yeah. Think of the meaning behind this right now, though, what this means. Picture his blood shed on a cross. Think of the suffering that we sang about one of the earlier songs. His suffering is my strength. His suffering, he suffered. He did this. He did this that we would remember this right now, that we are spiritually alive today, that we enjoy all the riches of heaven. That's what his word promises. I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, he says in his word. And we enjoy it because of what this represents. I'm a sinful man. I don't deserve this. This is my life treasure what this represents. Treasure together with me. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, though we have gone astray and everybody in this room has put their hope and their trust, has put their chips, as it were, in the physical, material things in this world. We have worried, God. We have been anxious over the stuff. Thank you for being sounded by that right now, Lord, by you, Lord. And by confessing this, we are, we are made clear, we are made clean, even as your word says, we have sort of cleaned off the spiritual windows of our eyes to see you and to understand we have no fear with you and in you because you love us and you have promised that you will take care of us and we believe you, God. 
So we go from this place, a people not full of worry and anxiety, God. We go from this place filled with unspeakable joy. But may the things that we speak give glory to you and serve to love one another because that will glorify you. We do this and ask this in your precious name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.